It can be useful to put the paraxial ray trace equations into matrix form. If you need to review the paraxial ray trace equations, then click here for my video on them and then come back to this one. There are two paraxial ray trace equations, per the organization of Joe Geary in his textbook on lens design. Praxial ray trace equation number one is Snell's law of refraction at a surface, referencing the angle to the horizontal rather than the angle to the normal, and that's angle U. Praxial ray trace equation number two describes the transfer of the ray from one surface to the next surface, for example, from surface one to surface two. It is literally the equation of a straight line. Both of these are written in the paraxial limit, which is the small angle approximation. So the angle u relative to the horizontal is equal to its sine and is equal to its tangent as long as u is in radians. The variable phi in paraxial ray trace equation number one is the refracting power of the surface where that refraction occurs. Refracting power is the difference in refractive indices on either side times the curvature. Curvature is one divided by radius of curvature. And in the case where we are dealing with a lens in air, the refracting power of that surface is just n of the glass minus 1 divided by the radius of curvature of that surface. Take these two paraxial ray trace equations and put them in matrix forms. I'm going to actually write two matrix equations, one for refraction at a surface and one for transfer between surfaces, beginning with refraction at a surface, say for example surface 1 in that thick lens illustration. The matrix equation will have a 2 by 2 matrix and a 2 by 1 vector, where the vector is the ray vector describing the direction that the ray goes and the refractive index times the angle. You could call it the optical angle, analogous to optical path length. And y is the height of the ray where the refraction occurs. The primes refer to after the interface, so n prime is the refractive index after the interface, u prime is the angle relative to the horizontal after the interface, and without the primes before. And if you look at the top row, you see paraxial ray trace equation number one. n prime u prime is n u minus refractive power times the height y. The second row of this equation is just the trivial statement that y1 equals y1, so it's kind of a placeholder. This matrix looks the same for all refractive interfaces, and so it has the common name of refraction matrix, which has always got a one by one diagonal with a zero in one place and minus the surface power in the other place. Transfer of the ray from surface one to surface two is also then put in a two by two matrix equation. Ray vector, which is the optical angle on top, and the height of the ray on the bottom, Y1 is the height of the ray when it begins a transfer, and Y2 is the height of the ray when it finishes the transfer. The top row of this equation is the trivial statement that n prime u prime equals n prime u prime, but if you look at the bottom row, you'll see that you have fractional ray trace equation number two. Y2 equals u prime t plus y1. This matrix takes the same form every time a transfer occurs, and so it goes by the general name of the transfer matrix and given by t. The double line above the t is my symbol for matrix. I don't mean tensor, I just mean matrix by that. So it summarize the two general matrices that you can have as a ray propagates, you can have refractions and you can have transfers. And in the case of that thick lens where you have a front surface, a transfer from the front surface to the back surface, and then the refraction at the back surface, you can describe the overall movement of that ray with three matrices. You have the refraction at the first surface, the transfer between surfaces, and then the refraction at the second surface. Applying those three matrices in a row like that gives you the description of the entire system. What happens to the ray between arriving and departing that lens? You have refraction at surface one, the transfer, and the refraction at surface two, and work out that three matrix multiplication to have the system matrix. Put a red box around it because that's the general expression for the system matrix of any lens. Now, if you inspect this matrix closely, you might recognize something about entry 1, 2, that is row 1, column 2, A sub 1, 2. Do you recognize what's in these little parentheses here? You might recognize that as the refracting power of the lens. And in fact, it is. The refracting power of the lens is minus the entry A1, 2. What it actually is, is one divided by the effective focal length. Because with a thick lens, you can't really talk about the focal length. You can talk about the focal length relative to a principal plane. 
call it the effective focal length. You can flesh out other points in this lens using this matrix. We can talk about the distance between the principal plane and the vertex. That can be calculated from entries in the system matrix. And this comes out of chapter 18 in Pedrati, Pedrati, and Pedrati, where this is worked out in very thorough detail using a different language than I'm presenting it in here. English, but a different matrix language. The separation between the back principal plane and the back vertex is given by you know, this combination. So we get both of these distances. But the principal planes are located using the system matrix. Optical engineers like to use the back focal length, which is the physical distance between the back vertex and the paraxial focus of the lens, is the sum of effective focal length and this V2H2. Now you might say, how can it be the sum? Well, look at how this is written. V2H2 with the line over, it means the distance from vertex 2 to principal plane 2. So in this illustration here, it's a negative number. And so that's why the back focal length can be shorter than the effective focal length. And the front focal length following the same principle. Now the principal planes could be inside the glass or outside the glass. And so these VH distances can be positive or negative. Beyond refraction and transfer, there's also a reflection matrix, which I will deal with in a later video where we will use it to analyze a confocal fabric pro resonator. So let's do an example. You have a thick lens with given radii, thickness, and index of refraction. Let's find the effective and the back focal length and the location of the principal plane for this lens. Pause the video if you need to to read the question. First thing that needs to be known is the surface refracting powers. So let's go ahead and calculate them, the front surface and the back surface. You notice it's n prime minus 1 for the front surface and 1 minus n prime for the back surface. And we'll use 1 as the index of refraction of air. That is the expression for the system matrix, and it's a very important check that its determinant is 1. So now let's find the points in this lens. We have the principal planes, H1 and H2. You have the back focal length, the effective focal length. Let's locate all of these things from this system matrix. The effective focal length is just 1 divided by minus element A12, and so we know right away the effective focal length of this lens is 60.31 millimeters. The distance from the back vertex to the back focal plane this is given by this expression, which I take out of Pedrati, and we get minus 2.057 millimeters. That's quite a lot of precision there. The back focal length that is 58.25 millimeters. And these are the variables that show up in a lens design software analysis. For example, effective focal length, which is EFFL and Zmax, and back focal length is also in there. Let's use the system matrix alone without the benefit of this expression to find the back focal length. Look at the ray coming in and the ray coming out. The back focal length is the distance from the vertex to the place where the ray hits the optic axis. So back to the original matrix equation that the end of a ray is the beginning of a ray times the appropriate matrices. So a ray vector doesn't describe the ray. A ray vector describes a point on the ray. You have the angle as the top element in the ray vector, and you have the height as the bottom element. And height, of course, can change as it does with this ray. Our incident describes this point right here, where the ray hits the front surface. It gives the height and it gives the angle of the ray. And then you have the system matrix A which describes the refraction plus the transfer plus the second refraction. And then you have another transfer matrix to describe the movement of this ray from the second lens surface to the focal point. And we will use that to find where that focal point is. The output ray is going to hit the optic axis. Y sub f is going to be zero and travels at an angle of u sub f in air, so n will be one. So if the first ray is the outgoing ray in air and the second one is the incoming ray, if we set y sub f equal to zero, then this t that we solve for will be the back focal length. Putting in BFL for t and zero for y final, we have a simple expression to solve. Look at the second line of this matrix equation, we can figure out the back focal length. Back focal length times minus 0.0168 times y incident equals 0.9659 times y incident. So the important thing is y incident cancels out. You notice it wasn't given. Only the assumption that we're in the praxial limit. And so we solve for it and we get back focal length of the same thing, 58.26, maybe a little rounding error there. Through self-consistency, we've confirmed that this expression for back focal length 
in fact, is correct. Because without a doubt, I believe this brute force determination of back focal length. Let's do this in MATLAB. So I put together a little MATLAB exercise. It's very short. And the reason for doing that is you don't want to have to get your calculator out and recalculate these things every time. It's nice to just have a function you can put numbers into. I wrote a function called thick lens matrix. The variable names are what they seem to be, R1, R2, index, and the thickness. First step is to calculate the surface powers. Do that, phi1 and phi2, and minus 1. It's the second index minus the first index, and the first index is air for the first interface, and the second index is air for the second. Let's find the system matrix. This is a 4 by 4 matrix. So you have a comma delimiter and a semicolon delimiter. Confirm that the determinant of the system matrix is 1. I will print that to the screen because I always want to see that. And now we can begin to calculate the important points. The effective focal length is just minus 1 over element A12. The distance from the back principal plane to the back vertex can be calculated from those elements, as is the back focal length. And then I'll put them to the screen. And when I run the function, I get my confirmation that the determinant is 1. I get the location of the back principal plane being minus 2.0552 millimeters in front of the back vertex. The effective focal length, 60.3, and the back focal length, 58.25. Same things we just calculated longhand. But now I have a function. I can just change those out. So let's look at that. Oh, let's change the back refracting surface from minus 80 to minus 40. And we get all new numbers, but the important thing is the system matrix still has a determinant of 1, but now the effective focal length has been changed to 43. Okay, we have gone over how to calculate the effective focal length and the location of the principal planes and the back focal length and the front focal length for a thick lens. A later video is going to do this for a camera lens, which has three lens elements in it and spaces in between, and we will again be able to use the matrix methods to do this.